Friends, peers, staff, fellow candidates, thank you for coming to this important event. As a libertarian candidate, I will return America to its intended form. Molded by our founding fathers who fought for liberty from their oppressive English rulers. A nation in which all people are sovereign over their own lives and no one is forced to sacrifice their beliefs unnecessarily. A world in which all people have the ultimate power, not the elected officials whose focuses are agendas that benefit their donors without regard for the consequences on the American population. For too many years, the government has oppressed the people and stripped them of essential rights which all are entitled to. I stand here today as the only candidate that will be the president of the people. My competitors will use you for your vote and for the next four years will not listen to your outcries for change, improvement, and progress. I am the candidate of the people and will execute the requests of the people. To remain a free and prosperous nation, we must hold the rights of the people in highest esteem. And to do that is to vote libertarian. Hi, my name is Julie Newman. I'm the Republican nominee for President of the United States. We each have different goals for the future of our country, but we can all agree on one thing. Our future should be defined by one word, success. To be successful domestically, we must dramatically cut back the scope of our federal government by cutting taxes and government spending and deregulating private industry, including repealing the Affordable Care Act. Internationally, we must implement immigration policies that serve our national interests welcome legal immigrants and protect American workers first, as they are our economy's greatest asset. Finally, the media seems to overlook two key issues, the big E's as I like to call them. Education and energy are essential to our country's success. I don't believe we need to pour more money into our educational system, rather I believe we should empower families to access better learning environments for their children and empower states to allow accrediting bodies to help with college tuition. I support relying on all forms of energy that are marketable in a free economy and on energy policies that increase domestic energy production. We are the only country founded on, on, on an ideal. The United States of America is unique. And the Newman administration will commit to the traditional ideal of freedom of opportunity that makes America great. So please stay original, vote Republican, and join me on the journey. Thank you. My fellow Americans, in the past eight years under a Democratic president, we have accomplished extraordinary change. We have added 14.8 million jobs to the economy, we have united as a citizenry, and we have taken the first steps for rebuilding our country. I implore you to vote for me, because as president, I ensure that we, as a united people, will continue the progress we have fought for, and I will properly manage this great nation. We will continue to stitch together this racially torn country by fighting the structures defining lasting racial inequality. We will increase the minimum wage so that all citizens can make a living wage. However, most importantly, our goal is to reform the current education format, making it financially stable for all. The DiPersio administration will attack corrupt institutions that accept gross amounts of federal funding and then exploit their students for money. By improving the education system, we will block the school-to-prison pipeline, building in its stead a cradle-to-college pipeline. As a generation, it is our obligation to improve the education system. It is our obligation to provide a future for our children so they can live in an America that we are proud of. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Noel Menares, and I'm here to represent not just the Green Party, but all of you as well. We're all gathered here today because we see problems in our country, problems that we can tell that we need necessary change. But the question is, do you want progress? Do you want a more peaceful, humanitarian, and equal future? Or do you want to step back in time? America has always been founded on the principles, that's our history. But what about our future, our legacy? When our grandchildren look back on today, what do we want them to see? I, for one, want them to see a group of Americans dedicated to making a better world. Your vote for the Green Party will allow us to work together for economic and ecological stability. So vote for equality, for democracy. Vote for peace and for justice. Together, we can achieve a more peaceful, brighter, and greener future. Thank you.
Thanks. Thank you all very much. Okay. I'd like to address the first question to all of the candidates. Um, and this would be with approximately one third of workers in the American economy being uncompetitive uh, in the um, global international economy. What would be your plans to address that particular problem? So, Mr. Daffron, would you like to begin? Sure. Um, initially, we want to work with education, which is where all of the skills for occupations would come from. We believe that the current education system is flawed and that we need to um, make it more about the students and the parents and their goals to where we make everything more attainable for those students. Um, with the workforce, we want to implement a more free market and um, competitive market. So we don't want all these government regulations to um, control the way that all the market is working. So in doing so, it would, um, it would help with competition and it would help with uh, jobs, and it would help with our economy. Thank you. So, I personally believe that we need to address three things. First, we need to uh, address energy. Uh, the Republican Party and myself support all forms of energy production, and the more energy we can produce, the more jobs we can create. Um, the next thing would be education. We need to, our government currently spends tons of money on our educational system, but I don't believe we need to put more money into it. I think we need to enhance the quality of it. And once we do that, we will have better, we will have young people that are better uh, prepared for the workforce. And then finally, we need to deregulate our economy. Our current administration has regulated it so much that it is barely even a free market anymore. And once we can deregulate it and have more room for competitive businesses, there will be more jobs. Um, I think education is the biggest part to make our jobs more competitive. I think we need to invest more in our children so that they have the skills necessary to take on more competitive jobs. And while doing that, we also want to fight for economic fairness and equality, like remove the barriers of uh, like too many kids these days are like growing up and um, like welfare states and poverty states and they go to school and like their education is not as good as what you get if you grow up in like a really good area so they're kind of trapped in that area and to get out of that cycle of just living in poverty and going to a bad school we need to invest more in our schools and to rebut mrs newman i don't see how you can improve the schools without investing more money into them as Mr. DePersio says, the Green Party also believes that education is the right step in creating better jobs and more um, competitive jobs for our kids. Um, we believe that we need to um, increase funding to the education program and the system, and we want to start programs for education from ne neonatal, neonatal ages and, and increase preschool funding so they can have a better um, option and better um, education early on and then we also are wanting to planning on creating the full employment program which will create about 25 million jobs just here in America so please go ahead so to respond to um, <laughs> so he said that he doesn't know how you can improve education without putting more money into it uh, currently our government spends over 600 billion dollars in our educational system which turns out to be like $12,000 a year for each student. I don't think that we should be spending more than that. I think that we should empower families that are, you said they're stuck in their current situation, in their current school zone. We should empower them to be able to go to any, um, any location that can help their student reach their full potential, but I don't think that requires spending more money. What do you mean by empower? Um, uh, it's path legislation that helps make it easier for students to attend the school they desire. Very big stance on nonviolence, and so what we were planning on doing is we're planning on cutting back arms and weaponry that we sell to other countries that are currently involved in violent and. Um, 
and revolutions to promote um, nonviolence and peaceful equality across the globe. And so what we would be planning on doing is we'd um, cut our spending there and try to back out of there, but we'd also want to, oh gosh, sorry. We'd also want to um, help find ways to promote um, nonviolence and to find peaceful um, solutions. Thank you. Mr. Uh, the answer to ISIS is not a war with ISIS. We need to comp continue Obama's method of uh, bombing them, and we need to rely on our strong allies. Thank you. I have to disagree with Mr. DePerzio on that one. I think that with the amount of destruction and grief that ISIS has caused, we should destroy them, exterminate them, whatever term you want to use. Uh, I think that we should come together with our allies in a diplomatic way to bomb them and get rid of them once and forever. Uh, national security is a major uh, key for keeping our country safe. And what we'd like to do is focus on keeping America at peace in the world. But in terms of ISIS, when it's actually a domestic threat, we want to um, make sure that we're using enough um, force to keep ourselves safe in our homeland and that's that is the major focus of the libertarian party is just to make sure that um, domestically we are safe um, but internationally we're not just um, being the aggressors and trying to find a war Um, in terms of refugees or um, truly any immigrants, um, we are 100% open to immigration as long as um, they are proven peaceful. And um, we understand that a lot of times with refugee situations, it's um, very hostile in their home country. And a lot of times um, we can help that, but sometimes we can't. But we do want to be open and um, make sure that we are um, helping people that need the help. Um, in terms of immigration, a lot of times um, immigrants or refugees can be, become very productive members of society and we need to be open to that as long as they're proven peaceful and don't have a record that would be detrimental to our country. I have to agree with Mr. Daffron on that one. I think that we should welcome immigrants as long as they come to our country legally and peacefully. Um, our country has a great history of welcoming immigrants However, we do need to make sure they come legally and pose no threat to our society as I believe that the security of our nation and its citizens should come first. Can you either accept these refugees with open arms and not fear them? Because put yourself in their shoes. Uh, these are people that are being like violently removed from their families and like like they're being forced from their homes by a terrorist group and we need to keep these families together and if like say a family wants to come into the country and like one of them suspicious we just need to keep the family together we believe that america was built on a rich tapestry of culture from immigrants from other nations and so we believe that if they're fleeing from political pro problems at their home country they should be welcomed with open arms here and we'd like to consider keeping their fees for undocumented immigrants to a minimum to help um provide a safe place because all refugees deserve a safe place for them. Okay, thank you all. This question is addressed to Mr. DiPerzio. In multiple times you have said you want to raise the minimum wage. Why do you want to do that and how would you go about doing that? All candidates will have a chance to respond, but you can go first as you were addressed. Well, raising the minimum wage empowers families. That gives them more spending power, and they're able to like have a living wage. Uh, right now, at the 750 minimum wage, that's just not enough to live. They like can't even afford food, basically. And increasing that to 15 dollars an hour will give them uh, a much-needed breathing space so that they can uh, uh, live, basically. Uh, when it comes to the minimum wage, we don't need to raise it because once we raise minimum wage, that'll mean employers have to pay their employees more. And once employees employers are paying their employees more, they're going to, going to have to let more go. It's not like you can just pay everyone more, everyone keeps their job, and it's great. It, that's not going to happen. Uh, this also brings up the issue of rising inflation. So. If we raise minimum wage, inflation will rise and unemployment is inevitably going to rise. Um, 
in terms of minimum wage, we're looking for a free market economy. And so the way that that would help is um, the government would be fighting the fraud. And then um, without the fraud and the corruption in business, um, we're going to have uh, more available um, funds to um, work with minimum wage. But it would be on a private level. The government really would not have any say in what the minimum wage is because specifically smaller companies can't necessarily pay um, a $15 minimum wage. And we shouldn't um, put the strain on them. We should allow them to uh, work in a free market and make their own choices for their business. Said, we also believe in raising the minimum wage to fifteen dollars because it helps create better um, environment, a better environment for the family. Because there are currently people who are working two to three minimum pay, paying jobs and still aren't able to afford basic care for their for their own children or be better education. And so we believe that raising it will help provide a better opportunity for the parents to bring in more income for them to provide a better life for their children. And we also believe in keeping businesses and ownerships to a small, biz small business because we believe in employee ownership and workplace democracy to help balance everything out. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Parzio again, and all candidates will have a chance to respond. Please address your position on gun control. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a Democratic candidate, I believe that we should um, increase gun control because right now in America there are just too many gun violence crimes and if we can control the guns then our murder rates will go down. And, 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 by controlling the guns, we protect families with common sense laws. Uh, uh, can we pass this on? Thank you, Ms. Newman. So, um, we have this thing called the Constitution that is supposed to be the law of the land. Um, in it, the Second Amendment says that it is our right to bear arms. I mean, we can eat, and it's a God-given right to be able to bear arms. I think we can either go with that or we don't. And I think we could look at the city of Chicago. Um, Chicago, I don't know if you guys know this, but it has the tightest and hardest gun control laws, but then Chicago also has the highest murder rates, like something like 600 deaths this year. So really, do gun control laws even work? I think that's the question we need to ask ourselves before we even realize that gun control is in conflict with the Constitution. And I'm going to expand on uh, what Ms. Newman said. Um, we are 100% for the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms because gun control really, that's not going to stop murders. The only thing it really does is embolden the criminals because they know that the person that they are attacking, their victim, they know that they do not have a gun or a way to protect themselves. So these criminals that um, usually might be a little bit more uh, timid to go into like a drugstore or someone's home because there might be a gun, um, now they know that because of gun control laws that that person does not have a firearm and um, doing that will not actually any um, decrease any of the violence. Thank you, Mr. Percio. Let Mr. Minara answer and then you can rebut. So we also believe in the Second Amendment that every person is, uh, has a right to bear arms, but we also strongly believe in that we should have stronger background checks. We also believe in closing gun show loopholes where people are able to easily access, easily access firearms when we can be uh, limiting the amount out by having stronger background checks. Go ahead. I was just, uh, so you guys think it's safer <laughs> if there are more guns on the street? Tonight, first one. So, if you're a criminal, you obviously don't have much respect for the laws. So, if we put gun control laws into place, is that automatically going to make a criminal think twice when they break a law? I mean, who are we trying to take the guns away from? That was more directed towards Mr. Daffron. <laughs> they won't have a way to defend themselves. Yeah. So, um... If, if we really uh, create a law that is restricting guns, like, uh, like Ms. Newman said, the criminals are they really going to follow the law if they've broken it before? But the people that do follow the law are the ones that are going to pay the consequences that way. So the people that are following these gun control laws are going to be less protected. And really, one of our biggest concerns should be our uh, domestic security. Anybody else? Anything on this um, question? I'd just like something to add. 
We also believe that that we want to limit the amount of firearms and um, and uh, strong weapons that the police have access to, and that we believe that we should limit what they are, so that we can limit police um, brutality. And states themselves must also pass legislation legislation to reduce or restrict said possession of police. Thank you. Um, adding on to how you answered that last question with limiting access to uh, major weapons for members of the police force, um, please address the problems of policing and minority communities and lack of trust and the division and violence that's occurring in our country right now and how you would handle uh, or improve this situation. Um, okay. Um, we believe we strongly believe in nonviolence, so we'd like to we'd like to cut back and find ways to help prevent the demonstrations that are occurring across the country. Um, we also believe that we must find ways to uh, we also believe we must find ways to <sighs> tired um, <laughs> sorry um, to to limit police brutality by <laughs> limiting the weapons. I'm sorry, I'm tired and I'm really thirsty, so. Oh. Uh, can we pass this on for now, please? You're good, yeah, absolutely. <sighs> I think we need to build trust in these communities and maybe not portray the police as being wrong, per se, in these shootings. It's a heat of the moment type deal when, you know, obviously no police officer is going out like, searching for a person to kill and and for these hard situations we need to increase the training and make sure that our police officers are as qualified as possible before they're out there in the field so that these unfortunate situations don't happen. that police brutality in this country is a problem, but I think that we need to focus more on building trust in these communities. Um, some minorities might be afraid of the police, they might not come from a country that has the law enforcement that we have, but we still must respect that the law is the law and not try and perceive it as like a suggestion. Um, but I think that just building trust between these communities I don't think there's really anything that's up to the government when it comes to this. Uh, the law enforcement's already in place. Yeah. Um, this is a big problem lately in domestic um, security, which is a big concern of ours. Uh, we, we believe that really it's about um, individual relationships. It's, it's not necessarily something that a government can change because um, although we can enforce uh, different codes or restrictions, um, it's going to come down to um, what these people think of uh, their law enforcement and what the law enforcement thinks of these people. So we need to work hard as a public community within um, our own communities, not just within the government, to uh, fight stereotypes and um, fight profiling so that any type of domestic insecurity like this can be um, fought at a public level and not necessarily just the government level. Thank you. Anything else? Any candidate? Um, back to me. <laughs> um, so we also believe that we should build trust between in the communities themselves, and we also believe that we should cut back on racial profiling. And so in that way, we want to also we want to build on the trust by protecting victims' rights and letting them feel free to speak out against their abuser or whoever's um, atta their attacker, so they don't feel like they're going to be punished afterwards. Thank you very much. Bless your heart. What specifically do you propose, this will be a question for all candidates, what specifically do you propose to ease the financial burden of higher education on students? Ms. Newman will let you begin on this question. What specifically do you propose to ease the financial burden of higher education on students? It is an issue in the country that college tuition is going up exponentially. Uh, I, I do not believe that this is the national or federal government's deal. Um, I think that this should be a state's rights issue, that the national government should empower states to allow accre accrediting bodies to operate, which will receive federal funds and then allocate the money out to different students depending on their needs. But I do not think that this should be a federal government issue. Uh, 
uh, like Ms. Newman, I also do not think this is a government issue. Education is uh, truly a parental responsibility and a responsibility of the students um, because education is a gift. It's not necessarily something that everybody gets. Um, it's something you work hard for. And uh, we believe that if the parents can provide it, or if the student can earn it, that they should um, definitely have that opportunity. But we do not want the uh, government to be as involved in the education because we feel that it's um, not actually helping our economy or our education. Um, and we um, believe that the parents um, should work hard and that the students should work hard to earn if they want uh, the college education and that they should work for that. We believe that we must break down big banks and that we also want to cut down military spending in order to increase the funding that we have for education. And we also want to increase taxes on the rich, the wealthy, and the corporations so that we have um, additional income that can be allocated to the educa educational programs. I agree with Mr. Menares on increasing taxes, but we just need to slightly increase taxes. So, and this isn't just your tax you're being taxed more and your money's just going away this is an investment in america like if we allow more children that are unable to otherwise go to college to go to college they can get educated and be a productive member of society and also we need to foster a, a cradle to college uh, pipeline so that more kids are on the college track too many kids these days are like they're going to high school and they're getting into trouble and we need to stop that and make sure that they're on the right track to succeed. Mr. Daffron? Uh, Mr. DePercio just referred to it as an investment in America, um, but I'm not really sure why we're investing through the government. Um, what we'd like to do is get rid of the income tax um, on the federal level. And by doing so, we're allowing the parents to have the money and um, they're taxed less and they have more funds and they can invest in their own children. Why does the government have to be the medium for the investment for America? Anybody else? Well, I think completely obliterating the income tax is a little bit radical. Would you not say that? It's what we believe. Okay. All right. Well. Very good. Um, anything else? Uh, this question is for Ms. Newman. It says, are you going to build a wall? Let's expand that and take a broader <laughs> stance on the problem of immigration reform. Um, no, first off, I'm not going to build a wall. Uh, I think that, personally, is a bit extreme. I think, however, we should implement uh, strong immigration policies. Nowadays, there are so many immigrants that are here illegally, and I think that we lose sight of the fact yeah, that if you break a law, you are a criminal. And that does not make these people bad people, but it does mean that they have broken a law. And so I don't believe that building a wall is a way to keep them out because we do welcome legal immigrants. It's just that we need strong immigration policies in effect that deter illegal immigrants from coming to the U.S. because then they will take American jobs and that that's just not the American way. Um, this is America. We were founded on immigrants. None of us were born here. And we should be... I mean, none of our ancestors. I mean, we were born here. So, um, like we said earlier, any peaceful people should be allowed to come into this country. Uh, we're the land of opportunity, and if we're not offering people that opportunity, it's not opportunity. Um, of course, though, immigrants with violent pasts or a uh, history of violence or um, attempts of violence really should not be allowed into our country because of domestic security, and that's our number one goal. But really, we should be open to immigration because these people can become productive and um, peaceful members of society like we have today here. Um, referring earlier to what I said, America was founded on a rich tapestry of culture and it wouldn't be how it is today if it weren't for immigrants. So we believe that, um, we believe that immigrants should be welcomed with open arms and that they should be welcomed and they should be, have access to e boarding passes easily if their backgrounds can be easily traced and verified. We also believe that if they've been in the United States for a certain period of time and they've been able to, con they've been able to receive a GED or high school diploma, that they should be able to be considered for U.S. citizenship immediately. And we also believe that if, they, if they've been paying Social Security, that has been gone, 
Social Security, they should be able to retake that money that's been paid for them and be used to restitution for legal fees to be able to gain citizenship. Well, personally, I believe bridges are better than walls, so I think we should make it easier. I think we should make it easier for people to immigrate to this country. And we need to keep families together and allow them to be, uh, be integrated into our community and start uh, contributing. So, um, I just need some clarification on what you're saying, Mr. Curzio. Are you saying that all these people should be integrated no matter if they're legal or illegal immigrants? Like, there just should be no borders. If you come in, you're automatically legal? Oh. The process right now is very tedious, and that's why so many people illegally immigrant immigrate. I think that if we make the process a lot easier, then illegal immigration wouldn't be a problem, and we would all be better off. Finally, we'll go back to foreign policy for a moment. Please explain your position on how the United States can effectively deal with Vladimir Putin and improve relations with the Russian government at this point and who needs a chance to go first uh, Mr. Daffron like we were talking about before America should uh, pursue peace in uh, international affairs we should not be looking for a fight however if it does come down to it and we're um, domestically um, going to be challenged by Russia or Putin we need to use all of our strength and all of our power to fight this back because we cannot allow for domestic um, violence at all in our um, homeland and um, currently right now we are um, acting as the world police but that's not really the position we need to be in because it's costly and it um, detracts away from our focus on uh, domestic security, which is really, we should be focusing on our own citizens. Mr. Menares? We are ourselves a very peaceful and nonviolent party, so we also believe that we should work together to cre create peaceful negotiations and compromises. But we also believe that we have a national security, so if it boils down to it, we have a right to defend ourselves. But we do strongly suggest peaceful and nonviolent negotiations and compromises. I think we should cooperate with Putin because he's technically one of our allies, but he's very power hungry and has demonstrated with the annexation of Crimea that he will not hesitate to just take whatever he wants. So we're not going to hesitate to respond to that Russian aggression. But this isn't to demonize all Russian citizens because we're going to stand by the Russian citizens and we're going to make sure that Putin's protecting their unalienable, una unalienable rights. So I believe that the current um, administ Obama administration has allowed Putin to accumulate way more power than he should. Um, I, he mentioned the uh, Russian invasion of the Ukraine. Um, I believe that when it comes to our foreign policy, we should always put America first. And while Russia is one of our allies, <clears throat> if they need assistance or if we need to be cooperating on something, I believe they should come to us because we, we need to put ourselves first. Yeah, I just don't think that uh, Putin's power-hungry ways are all the fault of the Obama administration or the Democratic Party. Uh, I think as a whole, the United States could have dealt with it better, but there's no real way to start a, or not to not start a war and prevent Putin from invading other places. Um, well, I did not say that it was the complete fault of the Obama administration. I do think that Obama's lax foreign policy has enabled Putin to accumulate too much power. He He's illegally uh, gotten to the U Ukraine and that just shouldn't have been allowed by the U.S. Uh, I think that Obama's black foreign policy has caused that. What would you have done differently? I just don't think we should have let Russia go into Ukraine. I think... No. <laughs> I, I think that uh, we should have... I don't think that you need to cause a war to be able to stop them, but I think some sort of military force should have been implemented. Let's give our hand. That's a big hand. Thank you. <laughs> I have about 10 minutes 
left in lunch now. I'd like to thank all of you again for coming, and, and you were exceptionally well behaved. So thank you for your uh, attention. I think they did a great job. Out. So please give them another hand before you go. If you are <laughs> not an AP government student, you are invited to vote for your favorite candidate. We have the ballot on the back. And thank you all again for coming. You guys were all awesome. Very, very proud. Vote Persio.